Yes, good evening, everyone, and uh, good morning to uh, Dr. Marielle Frischon, uh, who's joining us from Chicago today. And um, I, I just want to introduce her. It's such a privilege to have her joining us. She is a pediatric infectious disease specialist at Rush University Medical Center, a hospital that is set up in Chicago post 9-11 for handling exactly this kind of crisis that uh, we are in, in the world today. And uh, that became a dedicated COVID center for treatment of, um, of patients from within Chicago and across the state in the time of COVID. Dr. Frischon's primary work right now is with the Chicago Department of Public Health, where she serves as the COVID commander for the city of Chicago and has worked on the CDPH, the Chicago Department of Public Health uh, school guidance recommendations uh, for city schools and colleges as well. She is also the medical director of Chicago's immunization program, which is quite amazing, um, and therefore in charge of the COVID-19 vaccines planning as well. Just quick housekeeping rules. If you have questions, then please put them in the Q&A box, uh, which you can see at the bottom. Uh, if you raise your hand, we will not be able to attend to your questions. So hence, we recommend that you use the Q&A box. If you've already submitted the question before, then we already have those and we'll be talking about that. So um, don't put questions that you've already raised before. It will be helpful to keep clutter down in the box. Um, so I'll hand over to Dr. Frischon so she can take you through uh, the next 20 or 25 minutes and then we will uh, get into questions. So over to you, Dr. Frischon. Thank you so much and thanks, thanks for inviting me for this. Um, so yeah, so my experience at the Department of Health really um, stemmed from some Ebola experience that both Rush University Medical Center as well as the Department of Health had um, in terms of emergency preparedness. Um, and, and then as well as the case investigation experience gained from dealing with measles outbreaks over the last um, summer in, in the US, which are very different than measles outbreaks anywhere else in the world, just because of sort of the unique pockets of under vaccination that we see here in different communities for very different reasons. Um, and so we not only look to reduce barriers to access to healthcare, but then also to sort of dispel myths about certain parts of healthcare. Um, so for COVID-19, it's been a mix of everything. And when it hit, we really, um, you know, as many of you know, the U.S. has an underfunded public health system for years and money was sort of being taken away from public health, where Rush University was um, able to keep its eye on the ball to a certain extent and really build a lot of their emergency preparedness planning. Um, public health in the city of Chicago, we were doing, you know, a good job in our vaccination space and doing a good job in certain places, but we didn't realize until COVID hit really how understaffed we were and how unprepared we were for a pandemic like this. Um, so I'm going to walk you through a little bit of what we've learned so far and reopening varying parts of our city, including some of some uh, religious schools in our in our city. Uh, and then we can um, do questions. Um, so of course, as everybody knows, you know, in India right now is actually doing better than the United States as a whole in terms of its COVID control. But I think as happens anywhere, there are certain pockets that are worse than others. And this is something that we try to to um, dive into with our epidemiologists and with our data, um, because it, it really, knowing about your local, your sort of even hyper-local epidemiology and your case counts in your neighborhood or your case counts in your, um, in your area is, is really important to decision-making. And so I, we're gonna dive in a little bit more. When we look at our state in Illinois, you can see that we're sort of on an uptrend. Um, and we look at this data every single day um, and there are so many complexities to this data as well, as many of you know. The ways that you test for this virus have changed immensely over the past few months. And it's not just that really deep nose swab all the way back. Um, there are many different types of testing that you can do now. Um, testing that can look for a live virus, testing that can look for a piece of a virus, whether it's alive or dead. And then there's also blood tests that allow you to look for uh, whether you've had the virus before. 
uh, which is called the antibody test or getting sort of an IgG or a titer that tells you whether you've had it before. But even with that test, we don't know how long you're protected against the virus. We don't know how long that immunity lasts. So even that test is uh, hard for us to interpret sometimes because we're, we're still learning so much about the virus every day. So remember, this is a virus that's much like the cold virus. We'll go into some of the, the virus basics as well. But when we see an uptrend like this in, around us in, this, in our state of Illinois, which is where Chicago is, we, we get concerned. You can even break it down to county level. And so again, this gets to the point of just really knowing your local uh, case activity really well. And Chicago is doing fairly well compared to surrounding counties, mostly because we have a mayor and a public health commissioner who really listen when we say that we're worried about different situations. Um, I would say that a lot of our troublesome situations here happen with young adults who are doing bad behaviors. Um, we, we see a lot of parties without masks. We see a lot of adults in bars or restaurants unmasked. Um, and sort of when those behaviors are allowed to go out of control, you know, sort of Wisconsin is a good case for this, the state right above Illinois with all the red spots. Wisconsin has not had a masking policy. They're not worried about COVID. And when you don't have a little bit of worry <laughs> about this virus, that's when it's most happy. That's what it really, really can, can do some damage. But when you respect the virus, and you know its potential, we've actually had very, very good success at, at controlling its spread. So then you sort of look in comparison to other states that are surrounding us in Illinois, and you can that yellow line is Wisconsin. You see that really shooting up there, that line. That rate of rise of cases is also very important to us at the health department because it tells us whether we should be in a reopening phase or whether we should be in a shutting down phase. Um, and what we learned during the first phase of this response is that that sharp increase sh shutting down actually does help. Now, during the second wave, we've also learned that there are certain strategies during that first wave that helped more. And so we've been all, all along trying to use some of those strategies from the first wave to try to not shut down completely, but to try to continue to do certain activities. And we've been able to stay set steady in our city partially because of that. This is a dashboard that we use for the city. And, you know, I, I, I work with the infectious disease doctors at Rush too, and we look at this daily to sort of make decisions. Um, and that percent positivity is incredibly important. This is something for schools where different cities um, and different localities have used the percent positivity as a benchmark for whether it's safe to reopen schools. Um, and it's different for every place. So there isn't gonna be one cutoff that's good for you. And there isn't gonna be one cutoff that's good for us. It really depends on the density of the population, the behaviors of the population, the rules that are put in place locally. Um, that percent positivity can mean different things depending on where you are. We also look at our daily case count. Uh, on a seven day rolling average, um, because we find that our cases dip over the weekends because of reporting. Um, but we use that seven day rolling average and, and we've, we've been shutting down travel from outside states when they hit essentially what's equivalent to a 400 number. And you can see that in Chicago, we are approaching that 400 number ourselves. And, and part of that is we're testing a lot here. Um, and so you can see on the right, lower, lower hand corner, how much we're testing. Our testing, we're breaking records for number of daily tests in the city every day. And the more we test, the more virus we find. And the more types of tests that are available, the more virus we find. As a public health and an infectious disease person, this is good. This means I know more. This means I can pick up the phone and call that family and tell that family 
you know, to stay away from work and school. That, that, that's an opportunity for us. But the flip side is, is that it feels different um, for, for, your, um, for your local area when the numbers creep up. So this is something we're balancing and that we're learning every day um, what metrics are best to use to determine when it's safe to reopen schools. Again, getting to the point of being very sensitive to what's happening around you locally, we even dive into zip codes in our city to see what's happening zip code by zip code. And you can see on the Northwest and Southwest, Southwest sides of our city, this is the, the shape of Chicago. Of course, I'm very, anytime I see it, it's really enigmatic to me, but um, the Northwest and the Southwest sides um, is heavily Latinx for us. We have a lot of essential workers that work um, in these areas. We've had issues with meat, meat processing plants and other factories. We, our outbreak teams are very, very busy with outbreaks in workplaces. Um, and then those essential workers end up bringing COVID home and we're seeing a lot of household spread um, because of it. And that's something that we're trying to control. And we have ambassadors that are going out and um, we have a lot of Spanish language messaging that we're using and we're working with different community leaders to try to get the message out. Um, but we look at this data every single day to make decisions. And I'm, I'm, th this is something as, as a school district, we've, we've allowed the schools to, to um, class closure or cohort closure and school closure at an even more local level because of how unique some neighborhoods are in our city and, and how unique some situations and even schools can be. Um, and so this is also, this is interesting because this is how much we're testing in the city. So we're testing a lot more in the Northeast side than we are um, in some other parts of the city. We're doing a fairly good job, that sort of middle purple color in testing in the areas where we have a lot of cases. We're trying to send out mobile teams to those neighborhoods to test there. Um, and that's a big part of us feeling comfortable having schools open is having the test availability to send to locations to be able to um, make sure that families have opportunities if they've been exposed to get tested. Um, and so when we created our school guidance, we were keeping a lot of these things in mind. And we did, we did a lot of um, town halls with different groups of uh, school types. So we, our Orthodox Jewish schools, we did a town hall for them. Uh, we did a town hall for our Catholic schools. Um, and our Catholic schools are broken down into archdiocese, um, which is mostly elementary and middle school, and non-archdiocese Catholic, which is mostly high schools. And I can talk a little bit about the difference between those experiences, because it sounds like you guys are, um, you, you guys are sort of dealing with recommendations that are, um, that might have the older kids going back first. Um, and so, our public school system is the third largest in the country. And uh, we, we've had a lot of concerned teachers when we were talking about reopening in the summer in August, where we did some town halls with the parents and teachers of the public schools as well. Um, a lot of concerned teachers about being in the classroom, which is completely understandable. Um, but we've learned, a lot from, from our other schools and the experiences in terms of what we need to keep teachers safe in the classroom and to keep the students safe in the classroom. And we've paired that with our data that we get from our case investigations around daycares, around camps with kids, around sports teams with kids, and now around classrooms with kids. We've looked at all, all of that data to sort of see what works and what doesn't. Um, in the classroom. So we feel a lot more comfortable with our guidance now than we ever have. But of course, in this pandemic, we always have to know that there is research going on that may um, help us understand better some of these issues. Um, and we are constantly sort of going back to research and, and science to help us um, make decisions to make people even safer. Um, and so I'll, I'll talk through some of the, the questions that you all brought up within these 
um, uh, sort of going through what the CDC recommendations have been. We created our own indicators for school opening way before CDC came out with theirs in mid-September because we were charged with this in August to start talking to schools. Um, even July, we started we started talking about indicators because some of our um, Catholic schools opened in mid-August. So we and what ended up coming out for CDC is almost exactly what we decided to use uh, in terms of whether we thought it would be safe for schools to open. So this idea of measuring community burden and then also pairing that with how well the school can implement their mitigation strategies is, is a pretty core um, understanding within the public health community. And I also use American Academy of Pediatrics guidance um, and Infectious Disease Society of America guidance that comes out um, as an infectious disease doctor to try to make sure that we're not only looking at the public health side, but we're thinking about how the virus spreads and how easily it spreads depending on the age of the child. Uh, and so to go through a little bit of that, because this is definitely an area where we're getting new science every day. This, this is a virus that mostly spreads by big droplets. There's a lot of talk about how it's airborne right now. We, we've thought from the beginning, this is a potential to have tiny, tiny droplet or airborne spread, which means that if I sneezed, half of the big droplets would fall to the ground and half of them would stay in the air and you wouldn't be able to see them. With measles, measles is primarily those droplets that linger in the air. And that's why we're, and it has a very high infectivity rate just with those tiny little droplets. This is not like measles in that way. Most of the droplets fall to the ground with this virus. Most of these droplets are bigger. When you put on a mask, if you block those droplets coming out of your nose and mouth, you are eliminating most, most if not all of that airborne component of this virus. And some people say, oh, don't you need an N95 mask versus a droplet mask? If you block it with, with a mask, it's not gonna get far enough to linger in the air. And that's why we found masking to be so effective in this pandemic is because whether or not you have airborne or not, if that mask stops that ejection of those droplets, you're in, you're in good shape. And this, that one core um, sort of fact that we're going off of plays out in our investigations. We do not see spread in daycares in this country. We do not see spread in camps in this country. We do not see spread on sports teams when people are masking appropriately. The distancing is also important. The hand hygiene is also important because those big droplets, we, yeah, that, all of that helps. But when people are masking, we are not seeing transmission. And this is what makes us, it, it helps us pair the science with reality of how people function in groups. Um, and and we've, we are continuously educating these groups about how to really stick to their mask wearing. When we see spread in settings with children, it's when teachers eat lunch together in the break room. It's when teachers go outside for a smoke break. It's when teachers um, after work get together and get a drink. That's when we see spread. And if they get sick, they're bringing it in from behaviors that have happened in the community, not from behaviors that have happened within that childcare setting. So that's a really important distinction for me as an infectious disease doctor, because I, and also as a mother, the, the essential service of, of in-person learning cannot be reproduced. And there are certain populations like special education populations. Um, and for us in, in this country, we're thinking about preschool age children. Um, 
the social emotional aspects for the younger children of the in-person uh, education as a pediatrician cannot be reproduced. And so, and for our special education students, they are real, there's some harm that's being done to them by not being in their classrooms and, and being in their, in their communities. So we're looking at that equity issue as well as looking at some of these scientific issues to help us make decisions. So masks is number one every time. Social distancing, hand hygiene and respiratory etiquette. Respiratory etiquette is, is less of a factor when you're wearing a mask. They teach us in medical school that when, you, when you're wearing a mask in the operating room and you need to sneeze or cough, you don't turn your head because where are the, where are the gaps in that mask? to the sides. You're going to cough directly forward because that's where the that's where the barrier is. So that is something that people sometimes have to learn when they wear a mask. That's important. Cleaning and disinfection. We're doing more of this, I mean absolutely in hospitals, but in every office setting as well now. We're cleaning and disinfecting more frequently because if droplets do come out and land, which they shouldn't if you're wearing a mask, but if they do come out and land on a surface, and you are routinely cleaning and disinfecting, you've wiped away your chance of getting COVID. And so that has to be a piece of any uh, reopening. Um, but again, that mask, you can see how the mask cuts down on all of these transmission um, uh, ability. And then the contact tracing piece is the strength of your health department, partnering with your school to make sure that when there is a case at school, because there will be a case at any school that opens uh, that there's a decision made about the cohort around that child who gets quarantined and who, who needs to get tested and when do they need to get tested. And the public health department has to play a role in guiding the school on that. But we here in, the, here in Chicago have, have um, allowed schools to be a little bit more independent about making those decisions up front so that the messaging gets out quickly. And then they come back around to us with the lists of, of those who have been exposed. But we've done a lot of education to get there. So this cohorting idea, the cohorting idea is a public health strategy. And we have been very strict about our cohorting and our testing strategies to make us feel good about having in-person learning. So cohorting means that you know for one child exactly who is in the cohort of that child. And that includes the teacher. And we really do recommend that the fewer teachers that rotate through that classroom, the better, because then if that teacher is infectious, she's not only infected one cohort, she may have infected four. And that means they all need to go home for 14 days. Um, this is very difficult in high school and some of the older grades where we tend to have more rotating teachers. Um, and we do have schools that are open now in Chicago with rotating teachers. And all we can say is you just have more people that you need to quarantine. That's all, that's all we can say. And as much as we try to tell people, try to reduce that as much as you can, it doesn't stop it from happening. And so all you, those, those students flip to remote learning for two weeks and they're quarantined. And they, we recommend they get tested between days um, you know, five and nine, even if they're asymptomatic, and that they make they stay out for the whole 14 days. Um, and so there are ways that you can make your lives easier in the school because you know you will have cases, but each school has to sort of make that decision based on how many teachers they have, what your class size looks like, what your building looks like, because some buildings may have big enough rooms to have larger size classrooms. Um, and if you can distance, you know, up to 25 kids and they're six feet apart, if you have large enough spaces for that, then that is, and you have good ventilation, that's, that's doable. Um, and maybe you could reduce the number of teachers per classroom with that type of setup. Um, but for here in the city, for our public schools, we have 30 to 40 children per class. Unfortunately, this is something they've been trying to work on getting the class sizes down, but we have really large class sizes. And so they've, they've decided that the, the hybrid model of splitting the class into fifth pods of 15 um, and having them come in some days and, and do remote learning some days and then flip 
um, is a is is the strategy that they would start with to rephase. Um, ventilation. I have some slides on ventilation because people ask about this, but this also gets to um, th this is taken from actually New Jersey uh, Department of Health and their work with um, New, uh, New Jersey industrial hygienist company. And I never would have thought that I would learn so much from industrial hygienists before this pandemic, but oh my goodness, they, they are an essential resource. And I, I encourage you all, any HVAC expert or industrial hygienist you guys can get your hands on just to do walkthroughs of the school um, it is worth it. Now they may try to upsell you on some things. <laughs> they may try to sell you on some things you don't need, um, but because this is a big opportunity for them. Um, but in general, they will give you an idea of how to move outside air through your buildings. Um, how to keep windows open, maximizing air exchange. Um, if you need an upgrade on your filter system and your HVAC system, they'll let you know that. And then also the directional airflow is, is important with this virus too, because if you had someone breathing and you, and you sat someone next to them on this side and you have your airflow coming in from a vent that's going this way, that's not as good as, as if your airflow is blowing the opposite direction. So there are decisions that you could make like that in a classroom to reduce um, circulation. But at the end of the day, even when you look at all these factors, as long as that mask, that masking is enforced very strongly, this is bonus. This is icing on the cake. If you're enforcing the masking, you've, you've reduced your chances of getting that virus from person to person. I can't give you the exact percent because that research is not out there yet, but from what we've seen from our case investigation, we've had one transmission, possibly from a teacher to a student in a classroom among 20,000 plus students who have been back in the classroom. And I, I don't even know for sure if that's the case because we didn't sequence them, even though we wanted to try to. Um, so, so, so that's our, but, but that is to be expected, um, I think. And that was in um, a little bit of an older child. So just, I'm, I'm trying to think of ways to make this more relevant for you guys if you're thinking about having older children come in first. There are def definitely different challenges with older children than there are with younger. So again, these slides also, um, the Harvard School of Public Health, you know, have, has put together some simple ways of thinking about how to, just some check boxes before you reopen buildings in terms of um, having a good environment to bring students back into. Um, and then CDC has some general ID, sort of ideas about ventilation too, to check the building before you bring students back which are good, but again, they, they always like to, it's, it's, it's general enough, and I've asked them enough times, I've been a little bit annoying about this point with them, that this doesn't work without your core mitigation strategies. So they would prefer you to focus on the core mitigation strategies versus the ventilation, because right, the ventilation is the icing on the cake. And then ASHRAE is sort of the, the the society that guides HVAC and industrial hygienists. And they have also put out um, some guidance around what we know about SARS-CoV-2 and COVID in schools. Um, so I put boxes around where we are in Chicago right now in terms of um, uh, transmission in schools. Um, and you can see we're a little bit all over the map when you look at our core indicators. So this is something that would be interesting to do for your own school systems. Um, to see where, you, where you're at. You have to do some calculations based off of your numbers. Um, but you can see we're a little bit all over the map. We have great hospital capacity. We certainly have outbreaks because we're a densely populated city. Um, but our, our, our we are looking that top indicator as one of the secondary indicators is that rate of rise. It's not a great time to reopen schools. But we know that even when we reopen schools with the level of activity that we have, I think 99% of the transmission, and again, don't quote me on that because the data is flawed. 
<laughs> depends on who reports their cases sometimes. Um, most of the transmission is happening outside with community behaviors, not inside the school. And that's a very important distinction. Testing, very strict testing policies is a way to make sure that people with symptoms um, are isolated quickly and that cohort, co cohorts who have been in close contact with that individual are quarantined quickly. Um, and people mix up those ideas really often, the idea of quarantine and isolation. Isolation is for people who uh, are, have the disease. Quarantine is for people who have been exposed to the disease. So we quarantine for 14 days, we isolate for 10 days from symptoms or positive test. Very different. Isolation is for people who have the disease. Quarantine is for people who have been exposed to the disease. And so our very strict testing strategy, we've gotten a lot of pushback around this, but we have to do this if we are saying that in-person education is okay with the level of disease we have in our city right now. And so that is why we've been so strict about it um, is because I personally am not okay with us reopening schools unless the testing capacity is there to make sure that we're not spreading it in the classroom. If I thought at all that spread was happening in the classroom, to even, even two, 3%, I would say, let's scrap this. This is not the time. We, we shouldn't be doing this. Our case investigation has not shown any of that. <laughs> the very rare occasions where it happens, again, it's usually this teacher break room situation um, where masks come off and eating and drinking happens and people are within six feet of each other. And that's to be expected. Um, but there are ways that you can control for that behavior. The there are some questions that came in about asymptomatic and pre-symptomatic in infectivity. It doesn't matter if everybody's masked. And anyone who has symptoms, if you get them tested and isolated, then you're reducing the number of people that could be exposed. You're controlling what you can control. You're never going to be able to control what happens when they go home, especially if you're dealing with high schoolers. You're not going to be able to control what happens when they get together with their friends, because even if you tell them not to, they will, and they do. We even have some families here who have hosted pool parties where they don't wear masks, and we've seen 16, 16 people get it at a time. But those kids don't go back into school after that. There's a re-education period that happens. And the only people that we saw get infected from that situation was the kid that was carpooling with one of the cases. And there was no spread within the school. It was all the people at the party because they were at a pool party, so they weren't wearing masks because they didn't want to get their masks wet. So it's all about masking in the classroom. Your job as educators and our job as you know, public health and infectious disease people is to keep people safe in locations that are essential. And to us in Chicago, and I have a feeling for, for all of you, education is essential. And we really, we've, we've tried to find, you know, a, a framework where it can happen safely here. And it's been working so far with the schools that are open. Again, the, the number of tests that are out there is, staggering and confusing even for me as an infectious disease specialist. This is something I dedicate a lot of time to keeping up on. And the best source of information on tests is the, is the FDA here in the US. And so we look at the FDA a lot to see the data behind each new test that comes out. But there are a lot of people trying to sell tests out there that do not have good um, uh, do not have good uh, ability to pick up virus um, or people use the wrong test for the wrong reason. Um, and so we have a lot of problems with that here. Um, and the, the only thing that I can say is just um, 
having conversations with your local healthcare providers about how they're going to handle when you have an exposure at school and the school recommends that the that a student who's exposed needs to get tested. Um, and the doctor's gonna say, well, do you have symptoms? And the family's gonna say, no, the, the kid doesn't have symptoms, but they were exposed at school. And the pediatrician will say, oh, you don't need to get tested, it's fine. Just wait out your quarantine. Depending on whatever your rules are locally, your rule may be, oh, that's okay, that's fine. Just wait out your quarantine, that's fine. If there's a rule where like there is here that midway through your quarantine, whether you have symptoms or not, we want you tested, um, then you have to talk to those local physicians and local healthcare providers and tell them that the expectation is, is that these kids get tests. Um, and that's not an easy thing to do. Rush has a drive-through, um, the hospital that I work at has a drive-through uh, where kids can get tested and they've always been good about that, but it's not the same everywhere in the city. Uh, and so we, we struggle with finding people tests. Um, and so we've, we've also gone out and we take a van out as the health department and we have people do their own saliva testing. And then we, we do that saliva testing, the data on that is actually getting better and better. I was, to be very honest, I was very skeptical at first about the saliva testing, but the data is getting better and better on it, how it's almost equivalent to the nasopharyngeal testing. So, and, and people are, um, it's easier for people to do. And do you see the, the picture in the middle of the woman showing them how to do it in the car? She's not actually doing the testing. She's just teaching them how to collect their own sample. And so setting up more of those types of testing sites, it not only protects the workers who are there, um, it allows, and they don't have to be as highly trained because they're not collecting the samples themselves. Um, and we get a lot of testing done that way. So being able to send out mobile teams is another strategy that we're going to use to help parents and families who get, who we know will get a letter from the school um, that tells them if your child becomes symptomatic, get tested, or through, you know, throughout your 14 day quarantine period, we want you to get tested on day five or seven. So you, you really have to create this network um, for, for families. Um, so that's all I have for my slides, but, and I know that there are additional questions that were asked um, that, that I'm happy to answer as well. Um, so let me bring that up and make sure I cover. Um, so I think we talked a little bit about the antigen versus antibody. And the, the antigen test really has to be done carefully. Um, because um, here we really try to make sure that it's done when we have uh, when we have high suspicion of somebody having disease. Um, otherwise, the test doesn't work as well. So this is one of those those tests where PCR testing is actually the gold standard for this virus right now. Um, but depending on the availability. Uh, near your school, you might have to you you might have to use antigen testing. So antigen testing is okay, but we prefer to use it with people with symptoms versus people who don't have symptoms. If you're antibody positive, that does not mean to me that you need to be isolated necessarily. I have to have a whole conversation with you about if and when you had symptoms if and when you were exposed to someone who had COVID, that antibody might mean that you're immune for a period of time uh, and that you had it. And you're it's probably outside the time frame that I can do anything about it. So, so antibody positive for public health people, there's not, sometimes there's, um, we have to assist people with understanding what the test means. Um, but it doesn't automatically mean that that person needs to be isolated. 
Right. So one question, Dr. Uh, Dr. Vishon, was, uh, you know, we are, what we are seeing is that, uh, you know, because the government in India was doing these widespread sort of antibody tests, uh, going from home to home doing antibody tests. And then if people were antibody positive, they were also then tested an RT-PCR was done. So therefore an antigen uh, test was also done on them. And in some cases, what was seen was people who were antibody positive were also antigen positive. Is that just a false positive or is it possible for people who are antibody positive to be RT-PCR antigen positive? It is possible. Well. Yeah, okay. and we're learning a little bit more about reinfection as well. Right. But I, um, I, I would let the, the vi we, we, would, we would call it a viral test, which would be the antigen or the PCR yeah. versus the antibody test. I would let the viral test from whatever the antibody test shows, because this is more in tune with what's going on right now yeah. versus the antibody, which is more in tune with what happened two weeks ago. Right. So if a person is antigen positive, uh, even if they are antibody positive as well, it does not mean that they have immunity. It actually means that they have, they are infectious and they, uh, they could possibly pick up the infection as well. Right. So from a, for, I would say from a public health perspective, I would agree with yeah. that statement. That, that's yeah. what we would have to tell you um, yeah. because we don't want to take a risk um, of right. you potentially spreading either a new virus that was picked up right. um, or you still being infectious. But I will say that if that happened and you told me that your symptoms started 11 days ago and you're still antigen or PCR positive, I would say, well, you've completed your isolation period. You can go back to school and work. So there are situations where if it's far enough out from the onset of that person's symptoms, I'm actually okay with them returning. Right. Often in these cases, so one of the cases that happened with someone in our community uh, was it was antibody positive, antigen positive, no symptoms at all. Um, so it wasn't, there weren't any symptoms. There was no contact with anyone who had symptoms either. Um, yeah. So, you know, it's difficult to, it's difficult. Yeah, and in that case, think... yep, you just go off the positive test. Yep. And you do the yeah. isolation period from the positive viral test. Yep. That's right. That's right. Exactly right. Isolation period would be 10 days in that case, as you said, you know, possibly not the quarantine, which is 14 days. Um, uh, so those, that's one big question. Um, you know, something else that people have really been wondering about is, and, you know, our parents, I know, wonder about that. And I'm sure teachers do as well. Um, is uh, self isolation? Uh, I mean, self isolation. Uh, what is the what is the sensible way to go about life right now? You know, to wait for a vaccine um, for building immunity, or you know, or just go out and uh, with low doses. Is, is there a greater chance of people building immunity uh, through that, or do, do people just wait for a vaccine? It's so it's so interesting now. I mean, I think that's a really important question to ask. There, there are ways to go out in the world right now if, if you're wearing a mask um, and you can do activities safely with other people if you're social distancing. Avoiding situations where you have to remove the mask and eat and drink. Avoiding family parties with people who may be at more risk of dying of, of this virus. So people over the age of 65, people with yeah. underlying medical conditions like heart and lung conditions. Um, yeah want to avoid your contact with them because we do know that you could you could have this virus and not even know it yourself so you could think yeah. that you're safe to go hang out with an elderly relative and you might not be um, and so the choosing your activities very carefully and then also making sure that you're masked with all your activities um, yeah. it, it is a way to get through life right now the vaccine yeah is um is is going to take a bit from what we're hearing and so finding ways to do some of these activities safely um is is where we're at right now and while we're preparing for the vaccine campaign it's going to go to adults and high risk and healthcare workers and high risk adults first yeah children is not going to be probably for another year or so so oh, that's good to know so, yeah, so so we really have to find a way yeah. to safely do essential activities. 
yeah. um, and trust each other. Right, right. Uh, what is the likelihood? So when you're saying that it's, uh, we are also now looking at data on reinfection um, mm -hmm. and, you know, antibody positive people being antigen positive, so therefore also technically getting reinfected. Um, what is the likelihood of a vaccine even working? I mean, why would a vaccine work if natural immunity is not necessarily working? Yeah, we're waiting for that data to come back in. It's such a good question. If, from what we're seeing, if if a uh, if your first infection gives you two to three months of, of immunity, what we're seeing now is cases come out of people getting reinfected around this time. At the end of that waning antibody response, they get reinfected with an, another slightly different strain of the virus. And this isn't too dissimilar from what happens with flu every year, if you guys right. think about it. We choose a flu vaccine that has three or four types of flu in it. Right. And even when we pick those, there's usually one type that mutates and gets away from the vaccine and still gets you sick. And yeah. it's frustrating because you said, I got my flu shot and I still got sick. I, 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 I think, and this is just me saying this, this isn't backed up yeah. by anything, but okay. the COVID vaccine is going to end up being very similar. We're going to, we're going to find out that there are several strains that we want to protect against, and maybe we'll have vaccines that have three of them in them eventually. And we'll right. get a shot every year that has the three most common strains in it. Yeah. And that, that'll be the best we can do. Um, but for now we want to give, especially we want to give people who are at higher risk of dying we want to at least try to lower their chance. And so even if you lowered that person's chance by 30%, then that one vaccine was worth it for right. them to save their life. So right. that's where we're looking at the vaccine being useful now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, yeah, that makes, that makes sense. So I have to ask the question of herd immunity in that case. What is the, what is, what is the general prevailing view on, people seem to have gone silent on the thought of herd immunity. Um, yeah, well, it's there... become very politicized. It's become extremely politicized. And um, Does that even I would say is because that... there's so many strains, it's going to be hard for us to know when herd immunity has been achieved. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's, it's problematic for me, unlike measles, where it's extremely clear when you've reached sort of a herd immunity level, because measles yes. tends not to mutate. This yes. is we could think that we have herd immunity, but we don't. It, it would right. be very easy with this virus to, to get tricked. And so I, it, I again, to me, the, um, the living with safe practices and living with is the best, um, it, right, is yeah. the best way to go right now. Yeah. And the mask, as uh, I was looking at the CDC guidelines from some of the links that you sent, the mask, it's, you know, we really have to follow that, right? Over the nose around and just keep it on the whole time. Don't uh, take it yes. off and truly avoid probably lunchroom conversations, it sounds like, yeah. Um, yeah. because that is that is the time that you do have your masks off. Um, yep. And it's that. so hard to break those behaviors, but that, but yeah, anytime you're eating and drinking with someone, someone else, you should sort of have a safety check in your right. head and say, yeah. do, do I it. want to spread it to this person <laughs> if I right. don't know I have it? I, I right. have to do that myself sometimes. Right, right, right. So one of the questions that uh, someone had was on uh, was data uh, that you know that um, uh, the duration and intensity of the exposure is what matters. So I think it's does that is that a correlation? Uh, you know, I mean, if people who've been in touch with, let's say, somebody's passing by and uh, and you know, there's a passing contact, or you've passed them on a lunch line or something, versus you've been in a classroom with them uh, for a long time, is there a difference? duration and intensity of exposure, does that matter? You know, someone sneezing right in your face sort of versus not. What is the, is there a guidance on that at all? Um, I, this is again, an area where it's for full transparency, it's pieced together by stories and case investigation stories. And right. we have had stories of super spreader events so it's not only the duration and intensity of the interaction, but it's how infectious the host is also right. as a factor. And that's something you're never going to know. Yeah. When you, you come in contact with someone, you're never going to know how infectious they are. Now, if, yeah. they're, if they're coughing, 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 sneezing, I mean, 
just stay away from that person, right? But you could have an asymptomatic person that's actually fairly infectious. And so, yes, duration matters. And we use that 15 minute mark to sort of give us that, uh, that, uh, that cutoff. We also know that household contact, so that repeated close exposure, sharing objects, sharing food, sharing drinks, sharing glasses, anything you could think of that you do at home with your children, um, those types of interactions, so that intensity piece, Yes, it does lead to more transmission. And so right. we're even sometimes in some households telling people we want you to mask at home. If you're right. sick, we want to protect the rest of your family and we want to, we want you to mask at home. It doesn't work that well because yes. there are so many interactions you have with your household members that you can't protect from that. Hurt. So I would, yeah, hurt. I would say it's all three. So control so what you can control. But what, what was the 15 minute mark? I didn't get that. Oh, sure. So, so they've moved from a, from a uh, 15 minute continuous mark. So say you have a meeting and you meet for 10 minutes and then you have another meeting with the person later in the day for an additional 10 minutes. Previously, we would say, no, you don't count as a close contact because neither of those was over 15 minutes. Now we're saying it's a cumulative per day. You so you add those 10 minutes together. And if that's more than 15 minutes, then you yeah. do count as a close contact, whether you're yeah. masked or not. Yeah, yeah. Um, so guys, please uh, please ask any questions that you have. Taskeen, I can see your question that uh, you're saying that, do you uh, do a quarantine after an isolation? I don't think so. Is there a thought on that? Uh, uh, no, right? I mean, you don't need nope. to do a quarantine after an isolation. No. Nope. Um, no. at all but um, yeah so people if you have any other questions and keep asking otherwise I'm getting through your questions um, mm -hmm. so after an exposure with an active case of COVID uh, is it just advised to test right away uh, I mean we've had offices and friends offices where it, there was an active case of COVID in the office and everyone in the office was RT-PCR af right after um, with no symptoms at all is that the general right. advice no we what we've seen with how well the tests work and how well they're able to pick up virus, we prefer actually, if you stay asymptomatic, that you wait a few days. So the best time to pick up the virus is actually day five after you've been exposed. But we like to give people a little bit of a window. Things start to really get hard to pick up after day eight or nine. So we give a window of five to nine days after your exposure to try to get tested just to give, because because it's hard for people sometimes to get appointments right in that window or a weekend happens, et cetera. So that's your best shot at picking it up if you're asymptomatic. If you're symptomatic, right. you get it as soon as you're symptomatic, because in that situation, you're probably shedding at a level that you pick up. So it does matter right. whether you have symptoms or not. Right, right. So so what, what I'm hearing is that if, if there is exposure, uh, then... Uh, quarantine is probably the best solution and uh, then around the, between day five to nine even if you're asymptomatic you go ahead and test somewhere right. around then right because that's your best um, chance of finding it right 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 um so when after recovering from an infection when can a person uh, go back to work so you know uh, i mean after an active infection uh, is it so it depends on where from the start where does the person work what oh. setting? Um, well, it's an admin. It's an admin person. She's my assistant. Admin actually. in the school? Okay. Yes. Um, so so, at, so, after the infection, when can they return to work? Mm -hmm. So if they were positive, then that isolation period would be 10 days from your positive test or 10 days from your first symptom. So oh. after that period of time, you're safe to return to work because you're no longer infectious. 10 days but you maintain symptoms. all of the behaviors still. Everybody, no matter if you've had it before, everybody's maintaining the same behaviors just to protect each other and, and to create that culture of safety. Right. And it's not a matter of uh, 10 days or, you, or X number of days after you stop being symptomatic, but 10 days after that first symptom is what you're looking at. That's yep. very good to know because it, that's not information that is easily accessible. Um, okay. 
what uh, what about prophylaxis is you know i mean hydrochloroquine and all of that is it at all recommended any other prophylactic measures that are recommended no you know there, there had again a lot of this data is coming out so quickly it's not our typical sort of scientific review process but i have seen some fairly good information about vitamin d being protective um, and vitamin D is good for you anyway. Yeah. So to me, as long as you're not going crazy with it, um, it doesn't hurt. It's something that you yes. can take and it doesn't hurt as long as you're not breaking the bank, trying to sort of buy right. those, buy the vitamin D supplements. But otherwise there's nothing else that has been peer reviewed or in so a that's randomized interesting control because trial. Never, yeah, that's, that's interesting. Vitamin D, you know, not echinacea, not vitamin C, but right. Okay. Uh, whatever works, it'll be interesting. Yeah. Um, there's another question that if a family person is positive and isolated, uh, would family members testing negative? Uh, I mean, can they attend work? I'm guessing not. Oh yeah, this is oh yeah, this is always an interesting question. So, um, depending on what field they're working in, um, mm -hmm. the the answer may change slightly. And mm -hmm. so, this is where sort of talking with your local public health department is always important with the contact tracing. But mm -hmm. the Essentially, the people who have been exposed in the household should be quarantined for 14 days and not going to work. There's certain types of jobs that we still allow people to do, even if they've been exposed, if they're wearing the right PPE and they don't have symptoms. But mm -hmm. for the vast majority of people, if you have a household exposure, mm -hmm. you all are staying in that house for 14 days. Right. And, and, and again, the same thing. trying to get tested. Yeah. So, so, so while the person who is uh, positive will be then isolated for 10 days, the people who are, isol who are at home will actually be quarantined for 14 days from the time of that person's first symptom, right? So, act so actually, for if you can isolate at home from that person, you'll take that day where you started isolating from that person and do a quarantine from them. If you decide, oh, I have, you know, I, I have to take care of, of someone or I can't really isolate from them, you might have to quarantine from their last day of isolation. Um, so it would be 10 days plus 14 days. But that's another reason why we try to have people, all right, you found out that your mom is positive, you know, your, your you know, 75 year old mom is positive have her use her own bathroom if possible, or be very careful about cleaning that bathroom. Do not share meals, have meals separately, wear masks, because then that shortens your quarantine period if you can actually try to isolate from that person. Right, 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 right. Um, so I think we have one last question, um, and that this is um, uh, in pregnancy. How vulnerable is a pregnant woman and what extra precautions uh, would she need to uh, would she need to take are there side effects on the uh, fetus and you know and is any any thoughts on that yeah so in general with these questions about pregnant women I, we try to be very um, careful because we don't have all the data we need we've seen a, f a few bad outcomes but not anything different than what we normally see in normal times right, right. For babies too, I've taken care of babies in the hospital, even babies with HIV, with right. COVID. They're fine. <laughs> it's amazing okay. to me sometimes how well these babies do. It's not yeah. the case for every baby. There are some yeah. babies who will have respiratory distress and need to be admitted to taking care of those babies too. But the vast majority of children that are COVID positive because their, their mom was positive or for whatever reason, do perfectly fine. Um, and so for, for children and even newborns, we're seeing fairly mild disease overall. Um, but we do know that there is, there is this um, component of this inflammatory syndrome that we're seeing in children and adults that can be delayed um, uh, you know, up to two months after the infection. That can be a very serious uh, illness. And so... Ooh. I never want to discount that piece because okay. there are these serious outcomes, but they are yeah. They're rare. Yeah, yeah. So I have, as a result of that response, I just have to ask one more question because we are in flu season now or at the beginning of flu season. Um, you know, just quick thoughts on, are there significant, um, is, there, is there a very quick way to tell whether it's a normal flu or it's COVID? Uh, I mean, 
of course no if someone has flu they must stay home no yeah i my my best advice is to just get tested of course just get tested have... any time you have any symptoms that, that could be covid get to, and get tested for both um and that's the only way we're going to know and get unfortunately for both means yeah, antigen get and antibody both, both. or you get tested for flu and covid okay oh i didn't know there's a flu test so um that yeah, there could be know. a rapid flu test or there could be a, a pcr flu test that right, you could potentially right. get right 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 so great i think we will stop there thank you so much for taking the yeah. time we really um, i keep switching on videos i'm just trying to do two devices here um so thank you so much dr fishon for taking this time it was really helpful um if we have more questions coming up from the staff today this was a lot to absorb uh, can we send on some yeah. questions to you we won't ask you for another session but maybe you could just respond to some questions over email if possible uh, but Absolutely. we really appreciate we really appreciate this whole hour it's been wonderful to have uh, you share this information with us there's so much of this information that we can't access any other way it was wonderful to get it directly from uh, uh, your from your perspective yeah thank thank you i know it's overwhelming and it, it's a lot of information we're learning more and more every day so yeah feel yes. free to reach out yes thank you so much thanks for right. thank you uh, giving us this time all right have a great day bye bye